السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always begin with a smile, don't we? MashaAllah We always begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for He has given us every reason to smile He has created us He is the one who nourishes, provides for He is the one who cherishes He is the one in absolute control of every aspect of existence We thank Him, we praise Him We continue to praise Him against whatever difficulty we may be facing If we look at the goodness He has given us It eclipses completely whatever difficulty we may be going through. So all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He who was sent to us, chosen by Allah to be the best of creation, sent to us to remove us from darkness to light. And may Allah bless all those who struggled from the very beginning to preserve these teachings and to learn them, put them into practice, convey them to others, sacrifice a huge amount of, in every single way, so that today it got to us, may we be blessed as well. And may we realize the gift we are upon, and may we too learn, put into practice and convey it to others in a way that our offspring will remain steadfast on the path, and so many others will benefit from us. May Allah bless us all. Ameen. Brothers and sisters, this evening we are talking about some of the misconceptions, just some of them. Regarding this beautiful religion which is the fastest growing religion on the globe as you know and what surprises me or does not surprise me is that the more people begin to spread what is negative sometimes purposefully and sometimes one wonders whether it was purposeful or not it seems to be having an effect such that more and more people are turning to the beautiful teachings of Islam. One of the prime reasons people are searching for peace. And guess what? The word Islam refers to that peace. People are searching for happiness. They want to be free from the clutches of debt and interest. They want to be free from the clutches of being controlled by stereotypes. Islam offers that solution and Islam definitely comes up with the ingredient of peace and happiness both inner and outer for ourselves and humanity at large in fact including creation at large so why is it that there are so many misconceptions about Islam the first and foremost issue that we can probably make mention of is the issue of ignorance. People don't know. That's why they fear. That's why they stay away. When they look at you as a Muslim, for example, even if you don't appear to be a Muslim, the minute they ask you what is your name and you happen to give a name as Abdul Aziz, they would probably take three steps back and look at you differently immediately. That is because of ignorance. Because we tend to believe whatever the media has portrayed, not realizing that the media serves its purpose. It has an interest that it serves. If you, for example, or me, you or I, if we had to own, for example, a television station, what do you think we would do? We would make sure that we promoted whatever we believed in in the best possible way. I don't think we would engage in clandestine behavior to make other people who are reasonable or acceptable or good appear to be so bad. We wouldn't do that because our religion and our beliefs would stop us from being unjust. وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Do not let the hatred you may have for a people 
lead you to be unjust with them. Stand firm for justice, for indeed it is closer to piety. So piety is depicted by standing firm for justice, whether it is against yourself, your own people or family, your kith and kin. If justice happens to be such that we are to bear witness against them, as Muslims we are taught to do just that. Subhanallah. And Allah says, you dislike people, don't let that disliking of them lead you to be unjust. You need to be just. So Islam would prohibit us if we were to own media houses to portray Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, or even atheists as people who are beyond exactly what they are. Why then do we find on the globe, and we are Muslims, almost all of us would understand and appreciate that how we are being portrayed is not what we are taught. I think we would agree. How we are being portrayed is not what we are being taught. Can I see with a show of hands who thinks that what I've just said is not correct? If you think what I've said is not correct, then put up your hand. I do not see a single hand. This means that we believe that what we are being portrayed as is totally different from what the religion actually teaches. Subhanallah. Here we have thousands of people bearing witness to that. Why? Because you are educated. You know. You have understood the faith. You have understood the religion. So what would happen is, and this is something that Allah has planned sometimes, like he says, وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They may plan, and Allah plans. They may plot, but Allah is the planner, and Allah is the best of the planners. So sometimes we are taught, رُبَّ ضَارَّةٍ نَافِعَةٍ Something that appears to be so negative is in fact positive. But you don't know. Like when they came with the accusations against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying that he was, or in fact, let me give you a different example. They accused his wife, na'udhu billah, may Allah protect us and our wives, our spouses and everyone, of infidelity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nur, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُوهُ شَرًّا لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Those who have come with this slander are from amongst you. Don't think it is bad for you, it is actually good for you. Which means you are not going to be able to do anything about it by stopping them from saying what they have to say, the tongues will wag. But ultimately, what is about to come out of it within short term, and sometimes long term, would be very beneficial for you. So Allah cleared the name of Aisha radiallahu anha in revelation. So what happens to us when people intentionally spoil the image of true Islam based on the actions of a few misguided people, you would find that if the general masses would like to educate themselves about the reality, it would leave them only more inclined towards Islam. There can be no other way out. Today, we heard the recitation, a beautiful recitation of what we believe is a revelation from Allah. And if you were to study all the books on the globe that claim to be books of revelation, study them, look into them, see them, check them, you will definitely, or anyone on the globe who is fair-minded, will find the distinction of the Qur'an above all the other books. Without a doubt. Even if you were to open any scripture, and then you open the Qur'an, you will definitely see the distinction your hairs will stand. You will feel the difference as you are comparing in order to find the truth or to search for what is correct. So bottom line, with education and knowledge, we will only or we will be able to wipe out ignorance, hatred, intolerance and various other negative 
aspects of our lives. On the globe today, people pick on various matters. One, they pick on the women. That is something that is really a big deal. It's a big issue. They say Islam oppresses the woman and Islam keeps her in a specific spot. The reality is, Islam was the first, the first religion or set of laws that came to protect the woman. This was more than 1400 years ago. The others have only jumped onto the bandwagon a few decades ago. Do you know that? Take a look at Europe or America, not a long time ago, a few decades ago. Go and study it. I'm not here. That's not my topic. I'm not here to talk about whatever has happened in those continents. Take a look at them and have a peep at what happened to their women. And then look at how far back, centuries ago, Islam honored the woman. Can I give you one example? I can give you a few. A woman was looked at as a sex object. Whenever they wanted to amuse or pass time or perhaps enjoy themselves, the men would use the women in order to flash them around, in order to attract women, perhaps to strike some deals, perhaps to pay as payment for people whom they would owe wealth to. So they would take along some of the women that they had under their own guardianship and they would hand them to a man whom they owed a little bit of perhaps wealth to. And this was how a woman was used as an object of business, as an object of a sexual nature which undermined her correct status and value. So she had to display herself in order to be counted as a person who is really worth looking at. She had to show everything. So they were dancing naked. They were made a tool of entertainment for the men. They were considered a property, a piece of wealth. If you had a woman, you could actually market a lot because you had the power of bargaining. You had a woman, so you could bargain. This was a long time ago, medieval Arabia, what we would term the Jahiliya. And when Islam came, it prohibited all that. A woman must never be uncovered in order to suit the wombs and fancies of the men around her. Not at all. She must be respected and honored. She must be acknowledged as a human being. She has her role to play. She has motherhood, which has a level in Islam that is unmatched. She is to be treated like gold and beyond. And she is really to be acknowledged such that even though at any given time the closest male relative should be looking after her basic needs of food, clothing and accommodation, we will still give her an amount as a token amount, meaning declaring that she has the right of ownership of wealth. Whenever a person closely related to her passes away, even though the male who is then closest to her will have to look after her in terms of food, clothing and accommodation, the amount she gets will be token and it will be something great that she uses only on herself, unlike the males who might physically get double the amount but have to use it even on the same female. Subhanallah. Have you thought of what's going on here? And you will never allow her to be paraded as a sex tool in order to advertise your business products and so on, in order to lure the men to buy things. So what happened? She was given a status and she realized that I am no longer enslaved by what I look like, by my figure and by the way I dance in front of the, the men and so on. But now I'm honored. I have such honor and dignity that I can pray to my maker. I am acknowledged as an equal in so many aspects. But because physically I am different, I have a slightly different role to play. Subhanallah. This is what Islam said. It acknowledges the reality and the truth. And what happened? The women began to turn to Islam in numbers. In numbers, not only dozens, but in their hundreds. Amazing. From the very beginning up to this day, the larger number of people to turn to this beautiful faith are the women because they go through exactly what the people of the period of ignorance went through. And then they realize the beauty of Islam and how it came to safeguard them, and how it came to protect them. So what the world did thereafter, they still wanted to use the female. And so what they said is, no problem, you need to be liberated. That's a beautiful word. Islam liberated the female, definitely. 
But what is happening across the globe, words are being used and they are being reinterpreted in order to fit a different type of a meaning for that particular word. So you would find the word liberation would actually mean enslaving in a beautiful way. That's what it means. So if someone says, I am liberated in today's world, it would mean, brother, you are absolutely and totally enslaved, but perhaps by a different source, a different power altogether. May Allah protect us. So let's not be fooled by these words. There are people who are living in the most free and democratic countries of the globe, and they have still chosen to cover from head to toe. Who is forcing them? They have found peace in covering their hair and in donning the cloak in a way that they don't need to define the shape of their legs and compete with every other woman who perhaps may have a figure like a trigger. Pull the trigger and suicide is committed. Allah protect us. What that means is people become suicidal because the scale has two more kilos on it than the sister who is sitting next to you. Is that liberation? That is enslavement, to be honest with you. People are enslaved by makeup to the degree that they cannot answer the door when someone rings the bell at their apartment until half an hour has lapsed because of Revlon. <laughs> that is enslavement. And then we want to call ourselves liberated when a Muslim woman would perhaps put on her cloak, cover her hair and continue. It won't even take you more than two seconds. And people will not judge you like medieval Arabia where they looked at your body and then respected you for what type of a shape you had. In Islam, you are respected for who you are, your intellect, your contribution to society, to your family, your contribution as a mother, as a sister. You are respected for that. You are honored. You are raised. You are valued. Not because of your legs or your hair or your complexion or your lips or something else. No. But because of the real person you are and what you stand for. Amazing. What a liberation. A woman has been liberated truly. If you go and search, looking at the women of the globe who have accepted Islam and telling you why I have accepted Islam, you will see people who've been so liberated that they posed for Playboy at one stage and today they've turned to Islam. And they will tell you never again, never ever again, go to YouTube and search what I've just said. You will be amazed to find the sister speak to you with utmost spirituality. And yet, just a while back, she may have been one of those who was also enslaved in a way that perhaps people consider acceptable because of how it was put forth. May Allah protect us. So this is a grave misunderstanding against Islam, which Actually, every time people raise it in a negative way, it has a positive impact in the minds and hearts of those sisters of ours in humanity who have not yet seen the light when they go to search and when they see and when they want to increase their knowledge, they immediately feel the peace and the contentment in the statements and in the teachings and in the watching of the rest of the sisters in Islam. So they turn to Islam. They see the liberation in that. So this is one of the biggest things that are made mention of. The oppression of a woman. And the biggest point that is made mention of is the cover. C-O-V-E-R. Why does she cover? She is oppressed. We see people belonging to other faiths covering as well. They are considered dedicated. They are considered religious. They are considered spiritual. We have seen the images of Mother Mary that were not created by us, but created by people belonging to a different faith altogether, who have chosen never ever to show her image with hipsters, or a miniskirt, or a little perhaps vest that shows half the breast and so on. Never, never ever, they would show her with a long garb that Islam promotes. Subhanallah. Why don't they say the mother of Jesus was oppressed? Allah protect us. Mothers and sisters, do you want to taste liberation? Embrace the beauty of the teachings. Let people value you for your contribution, your sacrifice, your dedication, and not just for your mere looks. Because if you are happy for people to gauge you by your mere looks, there will come a day when wrinkles begin to develop. Then all your money, 
goes to those people who promise you to remove five wrinkles from your face for five hundred thousand dollars. And that only lasts five years. After that, they reappear. Do what you want, it comes back at a certain stage. And sometimes we defy ourselves because our health is failing us, but we just want to look young. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all good looks. Alhamdulillah, ameen. But at the same time, to be gauged solely by your looks would be very, very unfair because everyone looks different and everyone considers what is good looking totally different from the other. Although certain norms have been created, we as Muslims believe that we need to honor our sisters and really we need to raise their status to where they belong. It is a very high, lofty status, that full of respect and not that full of nudity and that full of being used and abused just by the male dominated world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. People might be itching to know the answer of so why does a woman, why does a woman get half of the property of the deceased father as compared to the brother, her own brother, the son of the deceased? Very good question. I answered it already if you were listening carefully. But I want to take a moment to be more clear. In Islam, a woman is always to be looked after for her basics in terms of food, clothing and accommodation. The duty lies squarely on the shoulders of the closest male relative, either the father or the husband or the adult son or the oldest brother or the group of brothers or if none of them are there, the closest uncle or the group of uncles, etc. If nobody takes care of her, the group of Muslims have to take care of her in terms of food, clothing and accommodation. If they are not doing that today, do not blame Islam. So does she need any money? The reality is, forget about the answer of that question. Islam has given her the money. Just to keep for herself, to use for perhaps a rainy day, the less male relatives she has, the greater possibility that the more distant males might not look after her, so she gets a bigger figure. Amazing. So if she is alone, no brothers, she gets 50% of the wealth. If there are just two sisters, no brothers, she gets two thirds of the wealth. Allahu Akbar. No brother would get that amount. The figures of half and two thirds do not fit for a male, they fit for females. Why? Because the more distant that male relative is who's supposed to be looking after her, the greater the likelihood of him running away from his responsibility and therefore she gets a bigger figure. But still the responsibility is on that closest male relative's shoulders. Islam has liberated you. So people blame Islam because the males don't look after the females. And then the male comes to you and says, you know what? You've got a lot of money, you earned a lot, come on, 50% of the wage you have to use for this and for that, or the money you've got, you've got to do this and that. It is only her goodness that she can do that by. You cannot Islamically compel her to spend her money even on the basics of herself. May Allah safeguard us. Some of the men are looking at me as though, why are you telling them this? <laughs> It's a reality. We need to know it. You are sinful if you do not look after the females around you. Those who are closest to you, it's your duty, my brothers. So male wants to sit back at home sometimes because he sees you sitting at home, you making the formula milk, and you just, you know, feeding the child, subhanallah. So what I will do, you go to work, I get paternity leave. So what happens? Whilst it is extremely important to support your spouse and your, your wife, during that very, very difficult time of childbirth and just post childbirth, it is important to know your role. You are still supposed to be a person who is responsible, fulfilling your role. So yes, as much as you will help her, you cannot send her to work and tell her, I'm going to sit back and relax. But that is happening in society. Do not blame Islam. Do not blame Islam. If she comes back with a Thick salary, subhanallah, because perhaps the two of you have decided together that she will work within a framework that is morally and ethically correct and upright. Don't come and claim a right to that particular salary. It's still hers. Out of her goodness, she may decide to help you and say, let's go 50-50. May Allah bless us all. 
I see the men are giving me even dirtier looks. <laughs> no apology, it's a reality. So my brothers and sisters, here is Islam. This is how beautiful it is. The fact that we show our beauty to our spouses is something that makes us much more valuable. It's something that makes us cherished. A man is generally created with a sense of possessiveness, which is so great that believe me, if he were to be an upright person morally, no matter what faith he belonged to, if there were others trying to hunt down his spouse, he would become very, very, what's the right word? Not wild, but perhaps upset, angry. Perhaps he would be provoked in a way that he may be thinking to do something quite silly. May Allah protect us and may he never make our emotions overtake our intellect. I mean. So what happens? If this spouse of yours is exclusively yours, there is a greater comfort within the home. Take a look at what's happening in what we call the free world, where people are undressed for every man to look at, for everyone to try to get. Really, that's what it is. So what happens? The divorce rate has gone up in some countries up to 70%. In some countries, they don't want to marry because of that. Yet, your life will never be fulfilled completely until you try your best to find a good spouse. May Allah protect us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us. I know I've spent a little bit of time explaining this issue of the females. The reality is because it's a major thing. It's, thing. it's a thing that we've been picked on regarding every single time. And someone somehow, somewhere needs to say, you know what? We are Christian and more than Christian. So Islam is made up of teachings of pure Christianity plus a few more teachings. Islam is made up of teachings of pure Judaism plus a few more teachings. Because we accept the Prophet Moses and Jesus, may peace be upon them. And so their teachings cannot be their teachings cannot be clashing with the teachings that we have, but rather they would promote what we have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. We have this notion that Islam is a religion only for a certain race. So some people think it's a Malay religion. I think in this part of the world it might be. I'm using that example because I presume the bulk of the people who had accepted Islam earlier would probably be Malay. Or some have a notion that it's just an Arab faith. You cannot actually convert or revert. Some have a feeling that perhaps it's just for Indians or Pakistanis. Different types of races and so on. The reality is that's a myth. That is a misconception. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا and we have not sent you except to entire mankind to be a bearer of good news and a warner. Allahu Akbar. Entire mankind. So every single person would achieve from that good news a lot of comfort if they were to adopt. And every single person would taste a share of the lack of that peace and comfort if they were to abandon that beautiful message. Here we are. So fortunate, so lucky. Let us get this clear. Islam does not belong to a specific race. I would like to think that the non-Arabs perhaps have taken the faith to different heights than the Arabs themselves. They have served the religion. If you look at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, most of the masters of hadith in the early years were non-Arabs. Do you know that? For your information, they were from somewhere in greater Russia. How did that happen? So now people say Islam is for Russians. No. Not alone. It is for mankind at large. You have every right to enter any masjid, house of Allah. Nobody has the right to ask you, what are you doing here? You are welcome, my brother, my sister. Nobody has the right to tell you, you're not allowed to stand here because you know what? You are not a Malay, for example. No way. You can stand right in the front and you can be from a country not only in Africa but right at the bottom of the alphabet, Zimbabwe. <laughs> 
For me, it's so easy. Whenever we are filling forms online, you know, you just got to drop that, the down drop. And I don't need to search. Go right to the bottom and click. It's mine. Don't worry. Wow, we are very lucky. So, I am not looked down upon because of where I come from, nor should you. Another thing, Islam, when it comes to clothing, has a specific rule, or should I say, a code of dress. And does not tell you you need to dress in this color, and this exact thing, and that's it. It tells you what to cover, because it is a broad faith. So if you have covered that modestly, decently, in an acceptable fashion, with the correct type of material, and the right cut, then you will automatically be a person who has fulfilled your obligation of dress. So for people to think that there is a specific type of a dress, if you would like to come across as a Muslim, they are actually engaged in promoting a misconception. You need to cover certain things in a specific way, with a specific cut, with a specific type of material and so on. But how exactly you do that, inshallah, we ask the Almighty for us to take a page from our predecessors who dressed modestly. They achieved a lot of peace and comfort. And they were really people whose eyes were always in the right direction. We have another misconception. Islam is a very strict religion. That misconception, I dealt with it last night when I had a chat. And I'd like to repeat it in a very, very beautiful way because I am in a place that I can make use of this example unlike if I were elsewhere. Islam has so many rules and regulations. If you think that, try living in Singapore. <laughs> I saw a sign as we were close to the border of Malaysia yesterday saying if you have less than three-quarter tank, you are going to be fined $500. <laughs> I said, Islam is not that bad. <laughs> and if you are to chew in this particular place, you will be fined so much. If you jaywalk, meaning if you cross the road so much distance close to or away from this uh, crossing, so on, this is what will happen to you. That's what will happen. Why are these beautiful laws in place in order to protect the interests of everyone holistically? Not looking at your personal gain, but looking at the country as a whole in order to protect the economy, in order to safeguard the place, make it decent, make it clean. So Islam has come up with just as many rules and regulations to protect you and I from being abused in any way, whether it is the economic rules of Islam, the dietary rules of Islam, the dress code rules of Islam, whatever else it is in Islam, perhaps the penal code in Islam, the do's and don'ts in Islam, if you think carefully of every rule, just like the fathers of this country have thought of beautiful rules so that it is such a beautiful country as it is today, you would find my creator and yours has actually sent down such rules so that you and I can live in a holistic way of peace. Justice. Coexistence. Amazing, these are the rules. So if one is to ask, why so many rules? Say, the more the rules, the better it is. Islam tells you, you do not do this. You do not, for example, uh, try and... Can I use the, the slang term? You do not try and chaff up somebody else's wife. Whoa. You can't say, why not? Oh, the husband will come and smack you, believe me. <laughs> if he's got, got guts. Allah protect us. May that not happen. May that not happen. Brothers and sisters, it's not funny. It is something really serious. And it is something we, we need to cry about. People are not happy because they think the grass is greener on the other side, not realizing that from a distance, it looks green. Get there and you will want to go back to what was actually green that you couldn't see. May Allah grant us closure. May Allah grant us goodness. May He make us from those who can respect our spouses. The difficulty with us today, we don't have time to speak with respect to one another. We don't have the common decency to acknowledge the presence and the sacrifice of one another. So we suffer. You married her, she was, mashallah, a flower blossoming, a rose in the garden. You picked her up and you took her. And mashallah, you benefited from her all over. And thereafter, when you notice that one of the petals might have slightly, you know, wilted towards one direction, 
you were ready to actually throw her and pick up another rose. Is that fair? That's not fair. You lived the life. You're the one who benefited. Look at the day you picked that rose. Look at how it was. Whatever happened as a result, you were included in it. So appreciate the dedication, the fact that this petal has wilted as a part and parcel of the reaction of my deeds, my company, my togetherness. Because can I tell you, sometimes as time passes, these petals send out an even better scent and they begin to appear in an even more beautiful way because the beholder is who determines the beauty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our women. May He bless our men. May He bless us all and may He bless humanity at large. So don't come and say it's a strict religion. It has rules and regulations. There are so many other faiths that have many rules and regulations, but they have lost them. Every time it didn't suit someone, they took it out. Islam, there's a difference. Islam is not decided by me or you. It is decided by the Almighty. And therefore you will always find something amazing. That if someone tries to misinterpret or to change something in the religion, they will automatically have people who will respond to say, this is wrong, this is unacceptable. And there are people who've tried. And there are so many who have responded. The pure truth is always there for people to search for and find. But Islam will not give up its rules and regulations based on what some people think is more advanced. Like we said, why is it that 36,000 suicides are committed on an annual basis in the USA by people who are not Muslim? Search this on the net, you'll find it. I read it on BBC a few days ago. Suicides went up, not Muslims. In which country? The most free country on the globe. So that means something wrong. What is wrong? You need to modify something somewhere, somehow. I haven't gone into it, I don't know. But this would obviously, if compared to the Muslims, we would be able to find that we are much happier people with greater contentment, with much more in terms of what we look forward to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in every single way. Another very big misnotion, and because I've got it in my synopsis, I have to tackle it. People believe Islam promotes polygamy. So they tell you, don't marry this Muslim man. You know why? Tomorrow he's going to get another wife. <laughs> Islam is the only religion in its scriptures that makes mention of marrying one wife. One. Do you know what the Quran says? فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدًا If you fear that you won't be able to cope and manage in terms of justice, and in terms of various other aspects of coping and managing, then take only one. Only one. So, polygamy is not something that is promoted for everybody in this religion, but sometimes it is a way out. It is a way out for those who perhaps have the means, the ability, and perhaps they have the situation whereby they would not be losing their spouses and children as a result. Today, I tell a lot of men who come to me and say, I'd like to take another wife. And I tell them, brother, ask them a few questions. And then you say, do not do it. And they say, but why? Because my brother, you are going to be losing your children, your wife, and so many other things in the process. It's not worth it for you. Why? It's not conducive in your situation. There you are. So it's not for everyone. And if you take a look, I was thinking of it when I read the subtitle that people are saying Islam promotes polygamy. How many Muslims are on the globe? We might say two point something billion. Okay. How many are polygamous? Believe me, not more than a few million. A, a small percentage, a little minority. And they are concentrated in specific areas of the globe where it is perhaps looked at as a norm. So why do people have to pick on this? Ask our sisters, subhanallah. If sometimes the sisters complain of their husbands looking at other women, the non-Muslims are complaining even more of their husbands sleeping with other women, not only looking. Allah protect us. Their marriages are breaking for the same reasons. So it's not got to do with Islam. Islam provides a solution. There are definitely more women than men, even today in the world. 
It's a reality. It's a fact. Whether we like it or not. So the Almighty provides a solution. If you take a look at statistics and you look at the numbers and the percentages, you will come to realize that there are females whom if every male had to only have one wife, they perhaps would not actually be catered for. They would need to lead a life without a spouse. So are they doomed? The answer is no. There will come a time when the doors open. I have studied some of the nations that promote the prohibition of polygamy completely, yet they promote openly gay behavior. So what that has done, and here I'm not here to speak for or against gays because that's not my topic, but what I am going to say is something very logical, and that is it has reduced the number of men available for women because there are men going to men. So what happens to the women? They are so happy and excited to be having a man at least. Subhanallah. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So it is part of a solution if you look at it. It's not the problem. And if you are a person who is not yet able to live in that particular type of a situation, then alhamdulillah you have people who will tell your spouse that look, do not do it right now. You know what? For your particular situation, it's not befitting. You are going to mess up your whole life, my brother. You are going to spoil your relation with your children and your spouse. And perhaps they are people who are not strong enough to take that type of a situation. So we need to be in control of our emotions. And this is why I say, don't think that this problem is Islamic. Let me take you through to other places on the globe. People who are not Muslim. They would have affairs with 10 mistresses. Yet they might be sitting on top political posts or whatever other posts. And to them, it's nothing. It's a matter of an exchange of perhaps a little bit of finances. They've used the female, left her as a single mother, gone, forgotten, to the degree that some of them don't even know who fathered their children. It happens. Then, it's only Islam that would have protected such a female to say, even if you have had a child, it would have been legitimately through what is known as a marriage with the responsibility of the man who would take care of that particular child and yourself for a specific period of time and perhaps the child up to the point when that child is either married or can fend for themselves. So it's responsibility. For someone to use you as a girlfriend is dangerous. Why? Because they perhaps impregnate you and run away. They would deflower you and go. And yet the person who was dedicated to marrying you and take up the responsibility perhaps would have been such a grand, such a great person, and you would always feel that I allowed myself to be deflowered by some fox or wolf around the corner. Yet, I didn't realize that there were decent people on the globe who would look after me completely. And I've worded it respectfully. My brothers and sisters, these problems are global. They are not just confined to Islam. But Islam has governed how you shall do it. Islam says, don't use a woman, don't abuse her. By treating her just like, you know, a friend and a partner whom you can run away from quickly without things. No, there are rules governing what you should do. Take responsibility. If you want, stand up like a man. Otherwise, please do not mess with my daughter. Allah protect us. Don't mess with my sister. And this is why every one of us males here in Islam, if you take a look at the hadith where a young man came to the messenger and says, I feel like committing adultery. Imagine how close the relationship was. He could actually admit that. I don't think a lot of our children would have the guts to come and tell that to us. But here is a messenger who came to the Prophet ﷺ. I feel like doing this. And the messenger says, while some of the companions were getting irritated with him, he says, no, hang on. I want to ask you a few questions. Would you like it to happen to your sister? No. To your mother? No. To your daughter? No. To your aunt? No. To your grand? No. Well, whoever you're going to do it with is someone's sister or mother or grand or aunt and so on. The man thought about it for a split second and said, I will never ever do that. Imagine it took him to educate him, took him a few seconds. So all of you, I'm saying, and to myself as well, all the sisters you see on the globe, they are someone's sisters, daughters, mothers, aunts, perhaps grands. So respect them as you would respect yours. Problem solved. That's what Islam teaches. Show me what others have taught. Amazing. 
we have another misconception. And that is the dietary restrictions of a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how food is for us. Ya shaytan. O you who believe, or O people, eat what is on the earth. Eat what Allah has provided for you on this earth. For as long as it is pure and permissible. Halal, that which is permissible. Tayyiban, that which is pure. It does not have a negative effect on your health in any way. Then you can eat it. So people talk about cigarettes. Just as well you are fined in Singapore to smoke. People talk about cigarettes. If you're a true Muslim, you won't find it very difficult to cut down and quit within a short space of time. Because it is not tayyib. It is not something pure that is good for your health. I see a few looking at me. I really do not have an apology for you today. <laughs> so this is what is termed halal and tayyib. Not everything out there is halal and tayyib. People say, why do I have to eat halal? Let me quickly explain to you in one way. There are many ways of explaining it. Life is given by the Almighty. Who gives us the right to take away the life? Whether it is a plant, whether it is an animal, no matter what it is, what gives you the right to take away the life that was given by the Almighty? Nothing. The Almighty alone can give you that right. So the Almighty tells you that if you would like to take the life away of something I have created, it needs to be for something meaningful. Something beneficial, something that you will be making use of, something that is not just going to be wholesale blanket destruction, even of the ecosystem. You cannot just burn a bush because you want to see what the fire looks like. No, you cannot just cut down trees because you're irritated of the greenery. No, but if you'd like to build a road, you say, Bismillah, in the name of the giver of the life of these plants. I'm going to destroy them because I need to build a road here. I need to build, for example, a building here. The term Bismillah is sacred in the name of Allah, in the name of the maker, in the name of the worshipped one, in the name of the giver of this life. I've taken it away. So we are not allowed to destroy or become destructive even to our own ecosystem before we talk about animals. If it comes to animals, it becomes even more prohibited to clandestinely take the life away or for no purpose, no reason. So much so that to just hunt as a sport is prohibited in Islam. Do you know that? You're just killing animals just because you ha you're having fun killing them. That's all. You're not going to benefit from anything, neither the skin, nor perhaps the meat, nor anything else, nor is it dangerous, nor was it trying to harm you and attack you. Well, Islam says, don't do that. How then can we justify the killing of fellow human beings if we're not even allowed to kill animals? I hope you're looking at what I'm saying. That's Islam. Islam tells you if you really have to because of the eating of that meat or beef, you will need to use the most humane manner to take the life away of that cow with a slice mentioning the name of the Almighty at a place where when you slice it there, which is the neck, the entire central nervous system comes to a total halt within a split of 0 point something seconds. Such that the animal numbs to a halt. All the blood is out because sickness moves in the blood to the degree that if you want to test for any disease, you only need a blood test. You thought of it? So that is why flowing blood prohibited for us Muslimin because sickness flows in the blood. The minute the blood is drained, the sickness is drained with it. So you need to slice it at a specific place with a sharp knife. And the Jews share this belief with us. And so do the original Orthodox Christians, although they may have turned slightly away from it. This is heavenly. It's something the giver of life has actually taught us. So you are not allowed to show one animal what is happening to another one. That is called halal. It's barbaric. It is unacceptable. The animal will die before you get there. And the blood will become really perhaps clotted. And this is why the best meat is that which the animal was not even suspecting to have been to have been slaughtered, for example, and yet it happened so quick and so fast, and it came to a halt with such ease in such a humane manner. That beef is tender. 
May Allah protect us. So, if I am to just kill cows like that, no way. If I am to use it as a commercial tool when it is an animal that has a life and I am to feed it in a pen that is not even fit for that particular animal, I am responsible in the eyes of the Almighty. Take a look at some of the chicken runs that you have today. Some of the poultry farms, they treat the, they really treat the chickens very, very barbarically. And nobody says anything. The minute you say halal, they don't realize you've actually been protected. One, from genetically modified foods. Two, from mistreatment and maltreatment of these birds or animals. Three, from so many other things perhaps. Subhanallah. From the fodder. You know, the feeding of that animal needs to happen with specific type of food and feed. It needs to be good and pure as well. This is all part and parcel of the halal system. And thereafter, you need to have made sure that whatever you did, you did it in a proper way. And people say, so what's this halal all about? My brothers and sisters, if they knew what halal was all about, they would only ever eat halal. It has protected us from so much. Then there are certain things we don't eat at all. And we share these with the Jews and the Christians, although some of the Christians may have abandoned their teachings. It's not our fault. Ask those of the Christians who have sound knowledge. They will confirm. You can go back to YouTube and see prohibition of pork in Christianity. You will find some beautiful preachings of churches. If you were to listen to them, you would think a Muslim is talking. Amazing. They tell you pork, prohibited, not allowed. It doesn't even have a neck. If you want to slaughter or you want to take the life away of a pig, it will have to happen in the most barbaric way because it's not supposed to be. It doesn't even have the ability to look up. It's one of the only animals that cannot look up to the skies. It has such a bad digestive system. Within a few hours, whatever goes in has come out. It has so much of disease in its flesh. Not only the tapeworm, but so much more that causes a lot of damage. Another thing, do you know that whatever you eat affects you as a person in terms of your morality as well? You might not know this, but if you study it, you will find it out. So if you are to eat vegetable all the time, really you become a much more passive person generally. And if you are to eat that which is halal, you become a more spiritual person generally. And if you are not bothered about what you eat, you perhaps won't be bothered about what you do as well. So this is why, my brothers and sisters, the dietary restrictions are placed not just in Islam, in all heavenly faiths that have a rooting up in heaven. Some have much more stricter rules and regulations than we do, such as the Jews, really. Sometimes if you were to sit with Orthodox Jews, you might think that we as Muslims are very lenient. We, are, we have so much leniency. That's a reality. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So people say, well, what about the issue of stunning? You know, you stun the animal. We would say, who has said that stunning helps the animal? One might say it confuses the animal totally and creates so much chaos and confusion in its mind that it takes much longer to actually die and the blood is not pumped out as quickly as it would have been if it was not stunned. And so many other findings. It just depends where the research was carried out, in which country, and people who have which type of inclination. Or what type of inclinations do those people have who carried out the research. If you are to put your finger on a hot plate, you would immediately lift it off. But in the process, your biology teacher will tell you what happened. The sensory nerves have felt the heat or the pain and they sent a message to the brain to say it's burning. And the message sends the pituitary gland is involved and the entire central nervous system is involved and it sends a message back with so many other forces to say lift that hand off and then your muscles react to it and lift it right off. It happens within 0 point something seconds but it has happened if the central nervous system that operates through the blood system and the jugulars are closely involved, have been slipped completely. You numb to a halt. You don't even feel what has happened. Before the message can come from the bottom of the neck to the top, to say, I am hurt, it's already ruptured. 
and before from the top of the neck it can go to the to the pituitary gland and get the message across it's already ruptured what do you feel nothing halal we've just become a little bit technical just to show you may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us ease and goodness we have another misconception that muslims worship a black stone or a black box that black box is only there to create uniformity it is the first house that was built for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prior to having faced there we were facing jerusalem which was also a house of allah the reason is no rich man must debate when they are building a masjid to say my house i've given the most money here so please let it face my house allah says face my house which house has merit the one which was built at the beginning first center of the earth so it is to create uniformity that's what it is we respect the place because it is a house of allah we don't worship it when umar ibn al-khattab radiyallahu anhu kissed the black stone he says to the stone i know that you are a stone that does not benefit and harm if i did not see the messenger kiss you i would have not kissed you the reality is we are taught to prostrate to allah on that stone so you kiss with your forehead on it and this is why when i put my head on the ground every day and you do it is never ever to anyone but your maker do you know that if you put your head on the ground for anyone but your maker you have associated partners with that maker of yours which is perhaps the biggest crime that could ever exist in islam so if i am putting my head on the ground does that mean i'm worshiping the ground does it no it doesn't i say there subhana rabbi al a'la which translates in fact it does not have an english translation but we could say glory be to he to my rabb rabb meaning the one who created me glory be to the one who created me and looks after me and is in absolutely uh, uh, absolute control of every aspect of my existence the most high whilst i have put myself very low onto the ground for who the one who is the most high who rabbi rabbun actually means whoever made me whoever is in control of every aspect of my existence so all i am doing i am worshiping whoever made me that is islam and that is the beauty of islam and that is what is making islam grow because today people are telling you when you have sinned come and confess to me and i will make sure that you are forgiven but backstage the same person may be committing greater crimes and is later convicted of sodomy and what not allah protect us so allah says no man annasu sawasiya ka asnan al mish people are equal like the teeth of a comb you seek repentance forgiveness you want to confess to your maker alone you don't need to confess anywhere else and your maker tells you if you confess to me regret ask for forgiveness and promise not to do it again i wipe it out never to be mentioned again amazing what beauty is islam based on look at it forgiveness allah loves you and allah says you've done something wrong you don't need to disgrace yourself across the globe no you just come to me tell me i'm sorry i'm wrong i regret i admit i won't do it again forgive me it's over that is allah he loves you he's waiting for that and you can repeat it on a daily basis and this is why none of us should become excited with the amount of worship we might have engaged in because we may have one deed that might drop us whereas there are others who may have engaged in sin once they will say oh allah forgive me they may have a level than we have within one short statement take a look at the magicians at the time of moses may peace be upon him and them at the beginning of the day they were magicians who were associating partners with allah at the end of the day they were muttered as the most loftiest of the followers of moses why they engaged in one prostration one not more than one fa ulqiya as-saharatu sajidin qalu amanna bi rabbil alamin rabbi musa wa harun and the magicians fell prostrate saying we believe in the lord of the worlds the lord of moses and aaron may peace be upon them 
When they got up from that prostration, they were threatened with execution and some narrations make mention that they were executed the same day because of what they did. And Allah says, we forgave them totally and completely. Brothers and sisters, if Allah forgave people who engaged in polytheism all their lives by one prostration, don't we prostrate so many times a day May Allah accept from us at least one so that we can also achieve that blessed rank. Amen. We get to the second last matter that I'm going to be addressing this evening. And that is a misnotion that Islam is a religion of witchcraft and black magic. Do you know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks about it by saying, Man sahara faqad ashrak. Whoever engages in magic has associated partners with Allah. It's over. Meaning they've left the fold of Islam. They can no longer call themselves Muslim. Because Muslim is he who surrenders to Allah. In order to engage in magic, you need to surrender to the devil. I'm not here to go into the details of how it works, but I know how it works. We've learned about it and we know. You need to worship the devil and the demon who comes to you sometimes in a blessed disguise. Like I said, in one of my talks here in this beautiful country, that when a thief comes in, he doesn't come in and say, I'm a thief. Open the door. I've come to steal. He comes in and he says, he comes in and he says, I'm the policeman. I've come to check if everything is okay. Oh, I'm here to read your meter. Oh, I'm this and I'm that. Once he gets in, then he goes for the kill. So the devil operates in the same system, the same way. He comes to us sometimes pretending that you know what, I can tell you who did what to you. So now we go to a person and we start finding out who did what to us, not realizing that there was a little jinni that they were operating with called jinn in the Arabic language who was lying to them all along and telling them, I am a companion of the Prophet. I have seen the Prophet. I'm telling you, your mother-in-law has done something to you. Why? Because the devil's job is to destroy a family. That's why. Mother-in-law. Up to today, I haven't understood why the word law comes into that. <laughs> I still haven't understood it. Why do they say in laws? Is there something, any lawyer here who can explain to us? In law, perhaps they might be fighting the case. I don't know. May Allah protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us good in laws. Either way, you know, this way or that way. May we be the best of people, really. May we be an asset to those whom we live with, my brothers and sisters. Say Amen. Amen. Now work towards it. There's no point in saying Amen when you don't want to work towards it. So work towards it. Ask yourself, am I an asset to my spouse? How do I address my children, my parents, my in-laws? And so on. And make a difference. Why are we calling ourselves Muslim? and creating a bad image of Islam, whereby our spouses will then say, do you know what? These Muslim men, sometimes the way they address us, they don't even acknowledge our presence. No way. We need to change that. Because this is how we will be able to wipe out misconceptions about our faith, by starting with the core, and that is the family. If we don't live in an orderly fashion, how do we expect others to get an orderly message from us? May Allah protect us. So as we are saying, magic, haram. Witchcraft, totally prohibited. Fortune telling, absolutely unacceptable. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man ata arrafan aw kahinan, fasaddaqahu bima akhbar, faqad kafara bima unzila ala muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever goes to a fortune teller or a soothsayer and believes what they have to have said, they have disbelieved in what Muhammad came with. May peace be upon him. Imagine, it reminds me of a story of a friend of mine who was at one of the airports and there was a man who came to him, he was there with his spouse, so a man came to him and his, his wife and said, I can tell you your future, I can tell you your fortune. He says, hey, I'm not interested. He says, I can tell you your fortune, I'm not interested. And you know, some of these people are persistent, so he kept on walking with him inside the airport until he sat down and this man sat close to them and started reciting fortune without them really listening to it. When he finished, I want my money. What money? I just told you your fortune. I need to be paid. What do you mean? So this man tells me I got up and while I'm walking away, I told him, 
if you knew the future so well, you would know that I'm not paying you any money. <laughs> Common logic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This business of wanting to know what's going to happen in the future can destroy you completely. People might tell you your past because there is a genie that they get the information from. Every one of us has an angel guiding us and a devil who tries to lead us astray and the soul in the middle who, who makes one of the two win. You might have to go into detail to learn what that's all about. We might talk about it another time when we are here, inshallah. So what happens? That genie can release information to his own bosses and cronies and colleagues. So now your whole past is there. People tell you, this is your name. You say, yes, this is your wife's name. You say, how do you know? I'm a saint. I'm a saint. Oh, he's a saint. This man knows. He can tell you what's at home. How does he know? He's just been informed. It's easy. Allah protect us only for those who worship the devil. And sometimes they don't know they're worshipping the devil. Prohibited. So then they tell you, you went to school. These were your results in the first year, second year. And you're like looking at him. But do you know me? He says, no, first time meeting you. But I know everything about you. And they give you the whole detail. Everything is so accurate about your past. Then they come to your they come to your future, which is near, and they've calculated it through mere statistics and by perhaps, you know, this graph technology, where if you draw a graph and you were to work out the mean, perhaps you might be able to continue the line further than this particular point. Like sometimes what perhaps an accuracy does. So now... You have this person telling you this is this is what's going to happen to you tomorrow because he already knows there is someone flying from Singapore to Dubai and there is someone else flying from UK to Dubai and we know the information of both of them so they are going to meet at this particular place because they are both planning to be sitting at the same place at the same time so they tell you tomorrow you will meet a man and you think oh and when you meet the man you say yes I met him I was told you start thinking that saint told me it was that devil that told you. You've been made a fool of. Muhammad wasallam warned you. He said, don't believe them. They will come to you with a lot of truth. But then they come to you after you have already been convinced regarding the past and the, the near future with items of the future that they have totally made up in order to enslave you completely. And guess what? You get enslaved. I can give you an example. There was a ruler or a top leader, let's say a king or something. This is an example. A king who was extremely big in size and people used to mock at his size. So he announced to his doctors and to the entire public that if anyone can actually help me reduce my weight, I would give them, I would make them my vice, my deputy. So everyone tried their luck. This doctor came, nothing. The other one came, nothing. That one came, this person, that person, nothing at all. One old man comes and says, hey, hey, you know what? Why are you so worried about, why are you so worried about losing weight when you only have six more months to live? I can write it down for you and I can sign the paper for you. You have six months left in your life. Why are you so worried about this weight of yours? Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. The king believed the story. He stopped sleeping, stopped eating, started giving things away, started losing weight. Subhanallah. Six months passed, the day came, he did not die. A week passed, he didn't die. He decided to send for that man. Where is that man? The liar! So they brought him across and he said, as soon as he entered the king's palace, he says, Oh, look at you! You've lost all your weight! It took you only six months! <laughs> So what's so much about the fortune telling? It was not the fortune telling. It was a worry that might have killed that man. Subhanallah. May Allah protect us. And in this case, some witty character was to be put as the vice or the deputy of that king. May Allah protect us, really. Brothers and sisters, Islam is a beautiful faith. The last point we'd like to mention this evening, Islam is a religion of violence. I'm sure a lot of us would be able to understand when people say Islam is a religion of violence, I ask you and I ask all the non-Muslims as well to go out 
and research thoroughly what violence has taken place on the globe even in the last week or month how much of it was perpetrated by Muslims and how much of it was perpetrated by non-Muslims but I need to give you a heads up what is it it will be easy to find one and it will be difficult to find the other it's not an Islamic thing violence is across the globe Every other day we hear of gun shootings here and there where more people have died than some of the major events on the globe. And every day we hear of so many people doing so many bad things all over the show. But the only time it's carried by the news is when your name is Abdullah or Muhammad or Abdul Aziz or ah Ahmed or something of that nature. Then suddenly it's made something huge and big. It means people are worried. That Islam is growing. That's what it means. And I've said it quite bluntly because that's what I think. It doesn't leave me with any other answer. How many of us here who are Muslim believe that Islam is a violent religion? Put up your hand. Not a single person. We are Muslims. We've learned Islam. We have the knowledge. We are Muslims perhaps for decades. A lot of us are quite old seated here. And not a single one of us believes that Islam is a violent religion. It means we are right. Islam is not a violent religion. So what is happening across the globe is not Islam. It is something else. It is either a frustration. It is either some form of something else. Like if you were to ask me, why does a Muslim commit suicide? I will tell you, go and ask the 36,000 who committed suicide in the States, who were non-Muslim last year, why they committed suicide. So it's something to do with humanity. People become violent for so many different reasons. In fact, I would like to believe that if you were to look at proportions of populations, Islam is the most peaceful religion. Out of two and a half billion people, you find a few people who are deviated in sometimes their thinking, the way they operate and how they have sometimes either been brainwashed or sometimes their emotion has taken the better of them so they use emotion labeling it religion and then they continue doing things that result in a great form of discomfort for all of us innocents who have nothing to do with it may Allah protect us sometimes that violence is rooted elsewhere where people are not bothered to go to the root of it well then the fathers of the solutions need to understand that when a man is sick you need to diagnose it thoroughly before you give him medication. Perhaps your medication might be making him more sick. May Allah protect us. So Islam is not a violent religion at all. Islam was never spread by the sword, to be honest with you. What happened in the early stages of Islam was returning what was usurped from them and fighting back those armies that had fought them or that had oppressed them in one way or another. Look at the people of Mecca when they were fought back. Why were they fought? They were fought by the people of Mecca themselves who were driven out. Their homes were taken and everything else happened. It is more of a liberation struggle or a defensive struggle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Islam does not promote terrorism at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Like we are all here in our thousands bearing witness that it's such a peaceful religion. Subhanallah. It, it really results in inner and outer peace. And it is really something that those who would like to study would be able to look into and perhaps get results either immediately or within a short space of time. But sometimes with us, we really, because of our ignorance, start believing people when they say Islam oppresses a woman. So we think maybe, yeah, you know, because we're ignorant. No one's spoken about it or we might have spoken to the wrong people. And you know what? Uh, Islam is barbaric. And we start thinking, mm, look at a few of these guys. Maybe. Astaghfirullah. No ways. You need to be clear in your understanding. You need to understand through knowledge. And you need to know your principles and laws. Like I always say, and I'm going to end on this note. I might just add a little element of humor at the end. But let me end on this note in terms of seriousness. Islam is knowledge based. The more you know about it, the more you will love it. The less you know about it, the further you will drift from it. Remember that. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and grant us ease. Every non-Muslim is looked at as a potential Muslim. A lot of us seated here were not Muslim before. Today we have gathered here. The Convert Association has invited us. Convert. The brother seated to my left was explaining to me how he entered the fold of Islam. Do you really think Islam was there to teach me to kill him off? If that was the case, we would all have been killed off somewhere up the generations. We wouldn't even be here today. The reality is, a non-Muslim is actually a scope of da'wah. Without him, they, they would not be a scope of a certain type of da'wah, propagation. What would you propagate? Nothing. So propagation is connected to the non-Muslim. When you look at him, you need to look at him as a client of your business. What's your business to try and sell my product to him? Now imagine you have a huge business and you're selling some real good stuff, real nice things, you know, technology, the S4 being sold for $50. Imagine your business. What happens? You need to sell your product. So anyone who passes you, morning sir, afternoon ma'am, morning sir, you give them a brochure, you say, would you like to see the phone? Would you like to enter? You have so many salesmen walking out there in order for them do you say every guy who passes you just shoot him dead? <laughs> Come on! Come on! What nonsense is that? If that's the case, forget about your S4. You'll be the S4 will stand for shooting for, not, not the Samsung 4. May Allah protect us. So when you see people passing you, you need to have a little brochure. Hello, my brother. I just want you to know what I believe. Here you are. Hello, my brother. This is a little disc for you. Uh, hi, good morning, my sister. This is a little disc for you. I just want you to know what I believe and so on. Your clients. Wallahi la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahidan khayrul laka min humurin naam. The hadith Allah says through the lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was directed to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. The day he was going into Khaybar. And the Prophet says, Wallahi o Ali. If Allah is to use you to guide a single human being. It is better for you than whatever va most valuable material item this world has. So that business I'm talking about a few moments ago, how you would give out brochures, far more valuable than getting your business to grow is to get your spirituality and your deen to be understood by others and to draw them closer to you. Perhaps even they would walk into the fold. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us all. I've been asked by one of the brothers to share a little point of humor since I mentioned it this afternoon and they really enjoyed it. So I think I'll mention it here again. This time off the cuff. Someone sent me a message a few days ago. The moral of this is firstly, we should not undermine the fields of others. You know, someone is in a different field to yours. Someone is a lawyer. Someone is a doctor. Someone is a plumber. Someone cleans the dirt outside there. This all is supposed to be, this all is supposed to be part and parcel of a circle that would not be closed if we did not have all these people. So do not think I'm a big professor. So the plumber is nothing. Because one day when your pipe bursts, what will happen? You have to phone the plumber. And he'll tell you, professor, sort it out yourself. And you will say, I can't. You need him. And this is the same that applies with the bin man who picks up the bin. May Allah bless us all. We have a system that's operating. That's why we are seated here today. We have people who have taken care of us. Do not forget to be virtuous to one another. Do not forget the virtue of each one of you. You are created interdependent, although you are totally dependent on your maker. To fulfill your needs, the maker has created certain ways and paths. And on those ways and, ways and paths, he has created interaction with others. So you want to buy bread, you need a baker and so on. So let me tell you, there was a professor who jumped into a boat and he wanted to mock at the sailor. A little man, the professor looks at him and says, do you know biology? He says, no. What's that? Do you know physiology? No. What's that? Do you know zoology? He says, no. Do you know geography? No. He says, you're going to die illiterate. You have done nothing in your life. You've achieved nothing. And this man is just looking, poor sailor, he's still rowing, he's rowing, he's carrying on. What's he on about? What's this old man on about? I've got certificates in geology, geography, physiology, 
and all the other ologies. <laughs> wow. Suddenly, a while later, the boat starts rocking. And it starts rocking. And then it starts sinking. And the professor curls up in a corner. Curls up. And the sailor is looking at him and says, What's wrong, professor? Have you studied swimology? <laughs> and so he says, No. He says, Do you know what is escapology? <laughs> professor says, No. He says, Well, then, if you don't know escapology from sharkology and crocodology, <laughs> you will dialogy <laughs> because of this mouthology of yours. What's the moral of the story? Always appreciate people who are serving in different ways than you are. Always appreciate people. Every one of us, really, we need one another. And at the same time, do not be from amongst those who despise others, lest a day comes when it is them you may need to solve your problem. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all, and may He grant us goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين